Tyler, to take a seat, please. It is a great, great fun night. So, we're ready, almost ready to start the second session. I should have mentioned at the very beginning, um, particularly when we talk about state laws, we have a few people from other entities with us, other states. So obviously these would not apply to you. And for all of us, you still probably need to contact your own local attorney because Tennessee's procurement laws are fairly complex. So because I will be hoarse in a matter of an hour or so, Karen is going to handle the introductions. So if you give her your attention, it would be great. Carrie's a lot taller than me, obviously. <laughs> um, first session we're going to do, um, Mark has been here several times and doesn't need an introduction necessarily. However, all bios are also in your program, so refer to those as well. Okay. I'll be it's first to give our speakers as much time as possible to share their information with you and have Q&A. Mark Mamatov has developed one of the leading financing and real estate practices in Tennessee with a special emphasis in public finance. His public finance experience encompasses a broad spectrum of financing, including traditional government financing and conduit financing for charitable institutions, low-income housing, and manufacturing facilities. He does work for Mass Perry and Sims, and he works in Knoxville as well as National. He's doing a joint presentation with Jason Mumpower, the Chief of Staff for the Tennessee Comptroller's Office. Jason has been responsible for the overall management of the Office of Comptroller of the Treasury, which comprises 11 divisions and more than 500 employees. He serves as a liaison to the General Assembly, representing the Comptroller on several boards and commissions, including the Advisory Council on State Procurement and Tennessee Housing Development Agency. I'd like to welcome them both up and give them your attention and appreciation. Thank you very much. It is great to be here. I'm Jason Monpower. I'm very uh, honored to be on the program with Mark Mamontov, who I've, I think, been on the program with before, and he's certainly more distinguished and learned than I am. Uh, but I know just how exciting it is for local government officials to see somebody from the Comptroller's office. <laughs> uh, it's always, I know, the highlight of your day, especially when, when one of us walks into your office unexpectedly. Uh, <clears throat> and so, it is good uh, to be here and to be uh, invited to be here. Mark and I talked uh, yesterday and, and uh, we went ahead and, and planned the idea that I would begin and <clears throat> that then he would go and then we'd both be available uh, for your questions. I, uh, uh, I am especially glad to be here. Uh, I, your organization, uh, the Comptroller's Office always has a pre-legislative session uh, planning meeting and a post legislative session uh, wrap up meeting and, and uh, members of your organization and different folks over the years have attended and we appreciate your participation we appreciate your attendance there and so I'm delighted to be invited and delighted to be able uh, to attend your meeting. <clears throat> um, I want to talk to you about a variety of things and, and a couple of things in particular going on that could uh, be of interest to you, I think will be of interest to you, at least those of you who live in Tennessee, and uh, may also uh, necessitate some action from you, action from you even in the next 10 days. Um, <clears throat> I'll say as well that I'm looking forward to your questions. I uh, originally had intended for our open record staff to be here. The Comptroller's office is a large office. <clears throat> As you heard in the introduction, we have about 11 different divisions, 550 employees and six offices across the state. And uh, one of the things that we, we hold uh, in the Comptroller's Office is the Office of Open Records Council. Uh, we do have someone who serves as the Open Records Council and we have a Deputy Open Records Council. And uh, I wanted them to be here with me today. Unfortunately, there's more uh, open records meetings. The Advisory Committee on Open Government is meeting today in Nashville, and, and when it meets, they staff that meeting, and so they had to be there. So depending on the technical nature of your questions, if Mark can handle it, I'm going to take it down and get my folks back in touch with you. 
But something that I want to talk to you about in particular, uh, by the way, and, and uh, I think Terry mentioned that state procurement is very complicated. And I will say that we are working diligently to make it less complicated. It's inherently complicated, and I don't know that it will ever be completely easy, but I am a member of the Advisory Council on State Procurement. <clears throat> the Comptroller uh, sits on the State Procurement Commission, and we are genuinely working to make it uh, more friendly, more friendly for you uh, as procurement professionals and officers, and, and more, more friendly for uh, vendors and uh, persons who are, who are going to be offering services and, and goods to your communities. Uh, and if you ever have any suggestions, always glad uh, to take that and hear that and, and try to work on that for you. Um, one thing that I want to talk about or talk about in particular is a project that's underway in Nashville. And, and I know that your uh, organization has been involved because uh, uh, you've had a uh, representative attend and monitor the committee meetings. In early 2017, the Tennessee Press Association, which is an association of, of newspaper and other media folks, <clears throat> gathered in Nashville and they spoke to leaders of the legislature and they said, you know, it seems like throughout the Tennessee Code that uh, you have open records laws that are meant to provide transparency and openness for the citizens of Tennessee, but it seems like there are an awful lot of exceptions to the open record that exist in the Tennessee Code. And uh, we would like for you all to take a look at those and see if they're still relevant today. Of course, openness and transparency is a buzzword uh, in, in really almost any organization, certainly in government. So the Comptroller's Office was asked by the Speaker of the House and the Speaker of the Senate to examine the Tennessee Code and define exceptions to the open record. The way the law is in Tennessee is that every record is, is construed to be open unless a specific exemption has been created in the Tennessee Code to prevent that record from being open. There are, of course, laws that govern meetings as well, um, and uh, meetings are perceived to be open unless an exception has been created. And, and so the Comptroller's Office took on that task. It took several months, almost a year. <clears throat> we completed, and this past January, delivered to the legislature a report on exceptions to the open record uh, that detailed about 538 different exceptions uh, that exist within the code. Some of them narrow, some of them broad, and some of them certainly relate to the issues uh, that you deal with every day, procurement and bidding and proprietary information and contracts and things like that. Um, once we delivered that report, uh, there wasn't very much that happened during the legislative session during the first part of this year. But once the summer began, uh, the speakers did appoint a uh, select committee to review the exemptions to the open record, and that committee has met um, in August, September, October, and they have another meeting scheduled uh, for some time after the election in November to see what to do about the exceptions that exist to the open record that are in the code. And I guess that's what I want uh, to be here today to tell you to the extent uh, you value uh, exceptions that exist within the code to the extent that the process you're involved in values exceptions that exist within the Tennessee code. It is time for you to take action uh, regarding, regarding those things, regarding speaking uh, to the members of the General Assembly who serve in your community and talking to them about either whether you think those exceptions need to be upheld and protected or, or whether you think it's okay for them to go away. Now, before I was Chief of Staff of the Comptroller, and I'm finishing my eighth year there, I spent 14 years as a member of the House of Representatives in Tennessee. Um, I still live in Sullivan County in Bristol, and I represented Sullivan and Johnson Counties uh, for 14 years uh, as a member of the House. 
And a couple things I can tell you. I don't know if you all know this. Uh, it may be under the radar. But there's an election in about 10 days. <laughs> Did you all know that? Always there. Uh, there's also one in Indiana. Who's here from Indiana? Uh, I noticed I saw somebody on the list from Indiana. Maybe they're not in the room. That's more of a barn burner than it is here in Tennessee. Uh, but there's an election in 10 days. You know, not only do we have governor's election, not only do we have an election to the United States Senate in Tennessee, but every one of you have in Tennessee, your member of the House of Representatives is up for election. They're up for election every two years. You have a local state representative and half of you have a state senator up for election. And I mention that because, and I, and I feel like I can tell you this with some degree of certainty, having been a legislator, <laughs> having been elected seven times myself, there is no better time than the next 10 days to extract a promise out of your local legislator, uh, you know, than the opportunity you have in front of you. The election's Tuesday, November 6th, and so that gives you a few days to reach out to them. How many of you from Tennessee who are here know your state representative personally? Well, how many of you know who they are? Uh, and then you, if you have another hand, how many of you know who your state senator is? And then if you know who they are and you know them personally, keep your hands up. So much fewer. Well, I would tell you, certainly there is no reason at all, uh, if you know who they are, and, and I hope you do, uh, that you should not know them personally. Because uh, the one thing I can tell you is a member of the Tennessee legislature, we have a part-time legislature, we have a citizen legislature <laughs> designed to be uh, for these folks to live and work and, and be in the communities they represent. And as I said, uh, when I was in the legislature, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a, uh, uh, an accountant, I'm not a procurement professional, I'm not a tattoo artist, I'm not a plumber, uh, but you vote on things that affect those professions every year. Uh, and, and so these legislators are looking for input from people who are, are professionals, and I know they would welcome your input. Um, I promise you, I was a member of the health committee in the house for 12 out of my 14 years. Every year there was a tattoo bill Every year, these tattoo parlor operators would be would be down talking, and if they can do it, there's no reason our procurement <laughs> professionals can't be doing it. Let me say as well, and I have this on my iPad, and, and if any of you would like it, I can email you the link to this article, or I can text message you the link to this article. There is a group called the Tennessee Coalition on Open Government, and you know open government is a, is a buzzword. We all, we all know that. And they just, uh, on September 30th, came out with a list of uh, exceptions to the public record that they are moving to target for elimination in the upcoming uh, legislative session. Uh, to go over the list to you, <clears throat> list with you, all these won't necessarily be important to you from the standpoint of your profession, but you know they're targeting, targeting uh, the elimination of the exemptions for investment records, um, for, uh, I don't know if any of you were involved in, in the investment uh, portion of your local government, uh, they're um, targeting the elimination of the exemption for performance evaluations of government employees, for accreditation reports for public hospitals, for tax information, particularly as it's related to grants and economic development opportunities uh, in communities. Uh, targeting investigative exemptions, uh, that's important, the comptroller's office are targeting the elimination of the audit working paper exemption, uh, going to hear from the comptroller's office on that one, um, for the, uh, the exceptions that apply to associations and nonprofit organizations. Here's one though that I think is going to matter to you potentially. They're targeting uh, the elimination of the exemption that uh, uh, deals with trade secrets and proprietary information. Um, because some of you may know, and I can give you an example, 
Uh, you know, sometimes as you're doing a bid process or pro, uh, process, or you have a contract process, certainly, you know, an example might be uh, if you come down to the Tennessee Tower in Nashville, we have restaurants in that Tennessee Tower, including Chick-fil-A, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorites. I <laughs> like to say that I have a body built on Chick-fil-A. Uh, <laughs> I got up early and went up and ate there this morning, as a matter of fact, uh, before I came here. Um, you know, uh, Chick-fil-A's recipe information and, and pro pro proprietary processes are in their contracts. And if that kind of thing is going to be exposed potentially, uh, you know, because they bid or contract with the government, they're not going to do it. And I will tell you that if that Chick-fil-A wasn't there, you'd have a lot of very sad state employees uh, down there in Nashville because uh, you can't get near it at breakfast or lunch uh, in Nashville. So, but I know that you have to deal with some of those things as well, similar in some of, in some of your procurements. Uh, also exemptions related to the lottery CEO, to student records. Uh, here's another one that might you might be interested in. And that is the exception that applies to uh, identifying information for employees. For example, if you're a government employee and you use your personal phone uh, for business, for example, this is my personal phone. I have the opportunity to receive a state phone, but you know, the last thing I want to do is carry around too. So I use my personal phone. So uh, I obviously take and make calls and send emails from my personal phone. And uh, things like uh, uh, making open uh, the uh, home and personal cell phone numbers of government employees uh, who use their phone for government business. They want to do away with that exception. Also, here's another one down here that I think is going to interest you. Number 12 on the list is they want to make public the identity of vendors that provide goods and services. Uh, for processing systems, telecommunication, and other communication systems, data storage systems, things like that. Uh, those things have been protected uh, with an exception because of, of um, the possibility of hackers gaining some knowledge that might make it easier to, to get into your systems. So, so that vendor information, they want, to, they want that to be made public where it's not public today. And finally, the 13th item on the list is reports of violence within correctional facilities. And I absolutely hope that doesn't affect any of you. Uh, but I'll mention it just in case it does. Um, anyway, the long and short of it is you have, you have a process that's unfolding in Nashville uh, that is geared around open records and the exemptions that exist. Um, I know some of these are real for you. I know some of these could affect you directly. And what I encourage you to do is A, be aware of it. B, go back home and talk about it within your local government. Because, because as you can hear, this is not just related to procurement, it's, it's broader than that. And three, to the extent that you and your local government think it's important, I encourage you to be in touch with your <coughs> legislators. A couple of resources that are available for you on the comptroller's website, www.tn.gov backslash comptroller. Uh, you can easily find the full report of all 538 exceptions to the public record that exist. It's easily accessible. It's searchable for you. You can, you can do different search terms and, and, and go through that report. Uh, if you'd like a link to this um, this coalition on open government list of things that they target for elimination, you need to give me a business card or write your name or something or your email address down. I'll email that to you. And uh, then when Mark's done, be thinking about it. If you have any questions about that or anything else that you know the Comptroller's Office does, I'll be happy to try to take those or be happy to take your information and get somebody uh, back with you that can more thoroughly answer your question. With that, I'll turn it over to my friend Mark Mamontov, who will uh, go next. He's the guy that 
to make a difference in your life. And he listed all the things he was not a tattoo artist, which I really didn't doubt. But you didn't disclose to them what you are. Which one? <laughs> the leading Lyft Uber driver in Nashville. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect five rating. I, hear when I, I live in uh, I live in Bristol. That's another reason I'm glad to be with you today because you got me more than halfway home <laughs> early on a Thursday. And <laughs> bumper cars. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. And so when I'm in Nashville, I'm away from home. And I've done that for 22 years. So I get out and drive a little Uber and Lyft. And no way. You never know who you're going to meet. And uh, Let me give you a little advice. That if you get one of those pictures that Jason's arriving in his uh, <laughs> Yukon, I think. Tahoe. Yeah. Tahoe, thanks. It's not a joke. We're talking about major major tip. None of this, uh, <laughs> at least a twenty percent tip and a five star rating even before he picks you up. So if, if any of you all are prepared to do that, you shouldn't be in this room because of like, no. we have a number of mutual friends. I hope you don't mind. I heard you told that story recently yes. at a at a meeting and so which is really incredible. I, I Jason's always the comptroller's office for years. This is an extremely important office, and since uh, Jason's been there, it's just you know, and, and Comptroller Wilson's a great guy, and he's a good friend as well. It's just both of them have made it so much more accessible, and return phone calls. I mean, wow. to get him to come and spend his day coming here is just really incredible yeah. because, as you all know, I come and cut up with you guys for about half an hour, but he's really telling you important important things. And for those of y'all, some of y'all never, I can see some new faces here and you're probably wondering who is this guy and what does he know about procurement? And the truth is I know very little about procurement, but I come every year because I get a Walmart gift certificate. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I wanted to share with you guys something really important to me is that I got a new stand, I got a new, new you guys, I'm showing a new dress standard here today. Um, I use my Walmart gift card from last year. All right. Hey. I want you to know, though, this is a Brooks Brothers shirt. This is the first <laughs> time in history anyone has worn a Walmart. My wife gave me this, and I figured, you know, that this hey, is this is, uh, this is really important. So, um, so I came. To think. And I'm really honored too. My friend Travis is here today. Travis is our operations manager at the airport. He's a big dog. He came with Michael. And I love telling Michael came, what, two years ago. I didn't even know we had a procurement guy at the airport. And so I'm up here talking about we need a procurement guy at the airport. He raises his hand and said, I am the procurement guy. The <laughs> so, and now he's, look, he's settled in. He looks confident, you know. And so it's really, uh, I even know that we have a procurement guy there now. So, uh, and he comes to all the airport meetings. And so he fits the Metropolitan Knoxville Airport Authority. We fly nonstop to 19 cities. Come on, Travis. Help yeah, me out here. Yes. Nineteen. So yes, yes. So if you're choosing to meet, what's that? I've got a Walmart shirt. You're wearing a Walmart, Walmart shirt. This is a nice shirt too. Sam's best. Well, I usually use toilet paper, and uh, I think this year I went for the tie this year. Sam's best. Yeah, it looks good. I like that. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got to think so. All right. And I got Alex. I have a new associate with me. This is Alex is sitting next to Travis. She knows Travis. So I think her job is to give out candy and to really answer the hard questions. So we have a couple of uh, questions, like, and that you can win a prize this year. It's not as fun as bingo. And so, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll be. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm not very good with microphones. and. Thing. And I feel like really uncomfortable in this room. It's just like you guys have gone up scale on me. It's like, <laughs> what happened to my procurement guys? I mean, they, they were always so thrifty. Where's Terry? Terry, who? You! You're blowing the budget here, buddy. <laughs> what, what happened? Give me too much water and I go wild. Oh, that's crazy. I mean, this is like upscale. I was feeling like. Last term, what can I say? Oh, <laughs> Jack, Karen Smitherman's regime. She's back to the uh, Music City Hotel, right, Karen? Maybe the Comfort Inn. Yeah, I think so. I think, but, but I was worried how upscale is. Then I tried to get some coffee, and they were all out, so I felt better. So, uh, <laughs> I'm sure Terry said they only would pay for one pot. So, uh, yeah. is that what happened? Yeah. Well, and you're going to tell me if you just be earlier and be on time, you would uh, get some coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, things. So, go ahead, tell me that. So, uh, uh, we'll see. Okay, so 
you heard the really important stuff. And I'm going to reiterate that this is scary stuff. I mean, it's funny because I mean, we all believe in open government. We talked about this yesterday. This is not a matter of open government. What we're here about is good government. And you can't always be the best at what you do if sometimes if you can't get everybody to submit bids for things because they don't want to have certain things be made public. And it's not just in procurement, it's a lot of stuff that we do that I think affects what you all do. And so we're going to chat um, this morning about, um, yes, how am I going to do this? On the podium? On the podium? Yeah. All right. I was kind of wondering how I was going to do this. So, where am I going to point it to? That could be a problem. Um, <laughs> Is it a laser pointer or sort of thing? No. Where is your pointer at? You want to just do it? Do you want to go back with her and then thing? So, anyway. As Jason explained to you all, obviously there's one huge law that it basically says all public records in the state are exempt unless specifically provided otherwise. You didn't bring the, I don't think I brought it either, the stack that you all did. Right. Uh, I mean, no, no, I didn't bring it. Yeah, I mean, it is, <laughs> they supplemented it. It is, uh, all right, you're awesome. And so um, the stack that um, of exemptions, but if you read through them, they were each thought out. It's not like they just sort of randomly said, oh, we're going to exempt this, we're going to exempt that. It's just years of experience have built up. And so, yes, if you go through the Tennessee Code, and whoever poor soul did that, I assume there's somebody in your all's office. Yes, yes the, the Open Records yeah, Council open guys. Records. Yes. yes. I mean, it's just like uh, Jason said, we're going to conduct a little water torture on you. And um, so, I mean, can you imagine reading all, what is it, 30 something volumes of the Tennessee Code looking for exemptions from the public records? My guess is they use some sort of electronic thing, but that'd been hard to do because it's not easy to look for exemptions from open records. It, it took them probably several months, I would think, to get, get that done. And if you look at it, I'm sure that the open record government people are saying, oh, look how terrible that is. You've got hundreds of exemptions. Well, most of them make sense, like social security numbers, health records, um, um, privacy records relative to certain investigations. And so it's not like this is that terrible. But I would argue, actually, that we've got a bigger problem that, that open records laws are interfering with good hiring and with good procurement processes in many cases because, so, you know, Instead of, yeah, you know, I'm sure there probably are some exemptions that could be revisited, but there's not this widespread dark government that we're trying to do things. And I know you guys know that of all people, but it's so broad. That's the general law up top of open records in Tennessee. So basically it says any public records. And as Jason was mentioning, I mean, your phones. I mean, there's been lots of requests in Knoxville for phone records for, yeah. um, um, you know, for anything relative to city business. Everybody's learning that text and, and emails uh, are the way to find records these days. Um, and that you have to promptly make them available for inspection. So you have this very, very broad law that doesn't distinguish between text, electronic records, and things like that. And so, so if you're a lawyer, you're gonna, it's a train that you're just going to drive right through the station and so okay i'm gonna ask jason to cover his eyes now but how many of y'all done your public records policy how about, by the way we have folks not from tennessee in the room nobody everybody here we got one guy where are you from florida are you, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> but he cannot sign your bingo. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's well, keep going. You better hurry. Who did this? We're done. I'm heading to Bristol. Yeah. <laughs> but if anybody needs to go to Bristol, I'll give you a really good raise. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, <laughs> and I think this is something y'all supported is that you, every local governmental entity has to have a public records policy in place a few months ago. 
Does everybody have one? Other than our friend from Florida? <laughs> I know KCDC does the best in the state, right? You drafted it. Oh gosh, thanks, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> He's so sweet. <laughs> um, and the airport authority is just as good because it's all verbatim. But the uh, <laughs> no, but lawyers never copy forms. You at least labor over every word. The yeah. um, um, so <laughs> this is a big deal because um, we get a zillion requests. I've really enjoyed. I think. Probably the most common email I get from the airport authority is, um, we got this guy asking for these things. The funny part is, is that we have a public records coordinator, but I think I get the email still from about 10 different people at the airport who still get requests in their departments, and we're trying to coordinate them a little bit better. And I think we are doing a better job coordinating them. Oh, he's sort of nodding, maybe. But um, the uh, um, uh, so. There's a great form on the uh, state's website that I guess they developed in the Open Records Council's office, and they're great. I mean, they're, in terms of like returning phone calls and getting advice, I mean, is, it, is that okay? To call? I mean, they're, yeah, that's, that's the don't hesitate to call that's them. I think they're very public service oriented and, uh, um, and they're very accessible. And there's two lawyers, if I remember right, that are available now to help with that. I mean, at one point, I think you are sort of short staffed because you didn't realize how many requests people would get for open records, but I know that the comptroller's office is invested in this and is trying to, to do a good job. So these are some of the things that we have seen come up a lot. As I just mentioned, like Travis might get, sorry Travis, I'm going to use like in his office request for blank, you know, and so and it, it may be an email to Travis or to Michael saying, I want this, right? Well, the state forms say that you can do a specific request for them. And so I often will get an email saying, should we give them this? And almost inevitably, I'm going to respond to them, make them fill the form out. And why, why be a stubborn jerk about forcing people to fill out the form? Because if you do it for somebody who you like and just say, I oh, don't worry about that, I'll just send it to you. But then the next guy comes along and jerk and is asking for a zillion records. It's going to take you a long time to do. And you don't ask them to fill out the form. Then you're sort of discriminating and they could easily say it's not a matter of discrimination based on like race or sex or anything, but it's still you know, it's not a good way to do business. They're going to say, look, you're being arbitrary and unfair. So if you're going to use that form, which I would recommend, use it regularly. Don't just wave it because it's somebody you like or know. Something that's come up in Knox County, I know, and I don't know what I'd be interested in see is what what do people do now if they want to take it? They just take a picture on their cell phone, right, of an electron of records in front of them. How many of you all allow that to be done? Somebody just sits there on your desk to do that. Matt, you allow them to do that in Knox County? You do? Why would? Can anybody give me a reason why you would not let somebody do that? Do you have a position on this at all? Our model record policy defers to each local government to make a decision on whether or not to allow it. Right. And I, but you personally, you, I mean, you don't know any reason why you wouldn't let them do that? Uh, potential lack of redaction. It's right. just something, uh, uh, reasons like that. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of a, a covering to make sure redaction is the number one reason. Got it. That, yep. that people don't have a tendency to put as much care into redaction. They're just making that, or just letting somebody photograph. Or, or if somebody comes in for inspection, things can happen very quickly that something something gets photographed. So you are okay either way. No, we're okay either way, yeah. So, and I assume if it's a thousand pages or something, you don't want someone sitting there doing this all day long on your, on your you know, if you have to. But, you know, I think that, um, Short things, that's fairly easy. And I know our mayor, Mayor Burchett, who's now running for Congress, he's not mayor anymore, but he, he made the policy decision that they were going to allow people to do that. I think it was well regarded, at least in the press. Um, submissions by email versus coming in person. Alex, you can correct me on this, but I think the, pup, the, the, the model basically says that they recommend that you can be able to submit things electronically, right? Yeah. If you normally conduct business like that. Yeah, if you normally conduct business that way. I don't know anybody that doesn't do emails and, uh, and, and if you are, don't take emails. That's like, so I think we allow email requests at the airport authority, for example. We allow them at KCDC to, to come in. But that's the hard part is 
the, the main, again, it's not being a jerk, it just means your time is, and our, yeah, we got a, our friend from Florida, if he asks us for electron, if he, if he emails you guys and asks you for a list of bids on something, you don't have to give it to him, right? Why? He's not a citizen. He's not a citizen of the state of Tennessee, right? I know he wants to be. He's been here for a short time. He's been to Dollywood. And he says, I want to be in Tennessee. And I want to wear orange. And not Florida orange, right? Things that, uh, um, but he, uh, but he, we don't have to give it to him because he's not a citizen. And so at the airport, we, um, and, and, you know, I should always say airport and KCC, we require, if you're going to submit a request, to include your driver's license with it to show you're a citizen. And we have seen that a lot. Are you, I've seen a lot of you all, and I don't know if it's seen the bigger folks like like Airport in Knox County as much and more than others, but we can see a lot of trolls out there just seeking procurement information. They may be in some sort of in just sort of data business and they're based out of Atlanta or Dallas or somewhere. And all they're doing is is hoping to gather databases to sell to other people so that they can rig their bid, basically, not in an illegal sense, but they said, oh, well, I don't need to bid that low to get that deal. That's not healthy for procurement. And it's a waste of your all's time to have to respond to those kind of requests. We found it pretty effective at the airport authority just to say, let's see your driver's license. And most times they don't have somebody in Tennessee. One trolling service, his son lives in Nashville, so he got him to resubmit it through his son. Um, um, so maybe I, we can get him evicted from the state, but the, uh, um, um, so, you know, that's really the best way to, to make sure that you're not, it's just not a procurement troll trying to, trying to get things. Cost of copying, make sure you deal with that in there. We'll, we'll have a little test on what's a reasonable cost of copy, but you can waive fees. The policies are really good about saying, you know, perfectly appropriate. I think we at the airport, we basically said if it's less than 10 bucks, we're not going to bother with it. Can't really doing an invoice and dealing with less than $10 is probably not worth it. I can't think we have the same sort of rule at KCDC. Is that right? A de minimis amount, or you don't. I have no idea. You don't. Come on, Terry. I think so. Hey. He's and does everything there. <laughs> so, and then also, if people just are peppering you with you with multiple requests. You can aggregate them together so that you don't have to respond. Because a lot of times people are just going to wear you out with these requests. They think like they got an upper hand, so you can not you can uh, try to pull them together. Get the clicker. Okay, what candy are we giving out first? Mm -hmm. Oh, Reese's pumpkins. The white chocolate kind or the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. I like the thing. So, what does this acronym, Jason, sorry, you can't, because uh, he, he would know too easily. What is this acronym for? Oh, way in the back. Oh, she's so fast. Sorry, guys. She knows me, and so she did it. She could get called on by doing that. <laughs> yes. What's that? So, yes. Okay, everybody could tell her she's a teacher's pet afterwards. It's true. So, so we're going to wait. So, you got it? All right. What about this one? P R R C. What does that stand for? Whoa, 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 you gotta hold, raise your hand so you can win. All right, so you start talking. Coordinator. Oh, you get it? Custodian, that's it. A coordinator. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, so you need one of those. So every single organization, how many of you are on your public records request coordinator at your organization? Are you that? How would you get stuck with that job? Were you sick that day? Yeah, you get a lot of public record requests? Oh my goodness. So we only have one person. You all dumped, all of you all dumped that on other people. Very impressive. I believe I have a lot of questions. What's that? I think I actually like revealed the last question. So. You did? I blew past it. Which my, was? My clicker's really happy. Happy clicker. 
I'm glad you have a happy clicker. <laughs> Test your. Oh, you skipped it. Oh. Well, yeah, did y'all see it? Think you it's on. So, what does our state tell us is a reasonable cost of cotton? Twenty-five cents. You got the black and white color. You got to guess two. No. He's my man. 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 I'll give him fifteen for the black and white. Can anyone guess the color? No, he's wrong on the black and white. <laughs> <laughs> He's cute, but he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what else we got? Come on, somebody guess. What's the reasonable cost for copies? Yes, ma'am. Is it 15 and 15? Uh, she gets half. Uh, <laughs> no, she got her copy. Oh, yes, she did. It was 5 and 15. All right. He's cute and smart. Okay. <laughs> I am so sorry. Golly, 15 cents, you can get it for seven at Kinko's. <laughs> That's a ripoff. All right. I had the most interesting experience working with the airport, and, but this relates to a lot of what we do. Is some of the areas where I think the open records laws are really hard, and I know this has been a big issue at UT, obviously, where we get to the most press, but we've seen it when we've hot recently. We hired that executive director at KCDC. We're curious, and we've hired a, a executive director at the airport or president the airport. It is really, really, really hard to do that and get the best candidates who don't want to be known. And not just want to say the best, to get a big pool of candidates because if you know your current organization knows that you're applying for the job and you're a group of 100 candidates, you have no idea whether you're going to be a finalist, a lot of people are not going to apply for that job, right? And so the only way, and I don't want to say a way around it, but it is the way around it is, and it just seems like a crazy way to have to do this is to hire a search firm basically to keep all the resumes private. So the search process that we have to do at KCDC and all the ones that I've worked with is, is basically you, you have to keep the, the, the consultant keeps all the records, and there's, by the way, there's a special exception really from this for school directors, which you, you can't really even get around to doing that, is, but this case from Memphis is really a very good case for this, where they hired essentially an outside firm the, the, that's a, essentially a, an industry firm to do, to basically to do the search for them, and so um, to get the resumes together and things like that, but you know, we had to be really, really careful to make sure that none of those documents got in the possession of any public entity. Because if they did, then they would be discoverable under an open records request. And it's a very fine line that you're dealing with. Is, you know, the entity, in this case is worth reading, the entity cannot essentially be serving as an agent of the government. It has to be um, independently contracted to do its work and that they do not have the decision-making ability. That it, the decision-making ability for who gets to be interviewed and who gets to be selected will have to be made by the public entity. So as we work through contracts to hire search firms, it's really important to try to parallel the reasoning in that case to make sure that they're um, that their scope of work is consistent with um, this, that the, uh, I don't know if there's another, is there another slide that's second slide on this? Um, so this sort of summarizes what I was just talking about is how the, you know, how best to do a search. I would argue to Jason and is that I think that other than the finalist candidates, the people that, that you shouldn't have to disclose their resumes. Um, it just seems to me that that's, Good government that you know, and that 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 um, that you shouldn't have to play all these games. That you shouldn't have to necessarily incur the expense of a search firm to try to get around open records laws. I mean, it ended up on both the searches I've been involved in and others that because of for using legal privilege and things like that, attorney conflict, that I ended up way more engaged in the process than is appropriate because using you know to having to coordinate with the search firm. 
um, and it really should have been handled more directly by the board members and existing uh, human resource staff. And so um, to me, it just, you know, they love getting, oh, here, here's who's applied for the UT job or Bella. How does that help good government? All it is is rumors and gossip and things like that. I would argue, again, I may be wrong. I, I don't think Jason disagrees with me. It's just not good government. You're not going to be able to operate. Now, my experience with these, these searches has been the people that are applying, if they know they're the last three or four people, they're reconciled that their name's going to come out. But they're not, they really don't want that to happen. They don't want their jobs jeopardized for that. And so, so it's a real process to go through. And if you all are doing a search that you, you guys are involved in sort of coordinating for any a job that would probably generate press, this is something that, again, I would encourage you to look at. The pricing information, I mentioned the trolls that were coming, but I really, I know you guys usually are really good about chatting. I'd really love to hear what you all have to, to say in terms of, um, I assume all of you all agree that you don't have to make public any bids or posts until they're actually open. I mean, the state law seems to me to be pretty clear on that, right? But are you all getting a lot of requests for pricing information from people? I saw a few people nodding that, and, 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 you know, and are you getting like people upset that they lost and then want to come see the winning bid and analyze it and things like that? Yeah, and I've seen a few folks nodding. What do you all think is appropriate? What should the law be in this area? Because the law clearly is right now that all of that information once the bids are open is public record and that you can get anything and that you have to retain that stuff for what is it? Six months? Six months? Um, six, oh, months? Sixty months? Oh, you can't just like trash them. After you open the bid, um, does this affect the way you're doing business? I mean, is this is this is this something that we should try to get with Jason and try to say we should be able to toss and lose the bid or losing? You know, one thing we're seeing, and I'm seeing as a man of the airport, that, that I think Travis came there just to make sure I got this done for him is uh, the. Uh, is a, is a technology contract, they don't want their pricing information made public because they see it as their proprietary pricing information. That's a loser. And I keep trying to explain that to them. There's no way we're going to be able to agree to that. Mm -hmm. um, but the, um, um, what, what do you all think? What is like, come on, you guys are not shy. How, what, what should the law be in this area? I mean, I don't think losers' bids are requested. I don't. Other than it taking up a lot of room in my file cabinets, I can't see any need for keeping it. We do, but you do keep I don't, them for I don't a see time. a purpose. Do you yeah. get requests for all I prices? Do not. I do not. Just usually the winning bid. Just the winning. We you, get them for everything. You get yeah, them for everything? Especially people who are trying to get their first contract. Mm -hmm. they, they review to see how was it written, what did this person write, what should I be writing in mind. So I think they use them as, as research. And if I threw it away, I've taken a valuable tool away from someone who's trying to get their first contract. And they don't have a clue of what they're supposed to be doing. And I have ample resources for them sitting in my office. Mm -hmm. And is this a hassle for you? I think it's a service. Uh -huh. So, so in order, and I mean, if, if you have a sort of some younger, uh, somebody trying to start up in the business, it really helps them to have access. Access but to this information. In our agency, I can't speak for any other agency. Yeah. We do pride ourselves on that. Uh -huh. We have a dedicated staff person whose job it is is to seek out those businesses and try to do business with those businesses. Right. So we can invest the time in that. I don't know that every agency can. Matt, tell me what Knox County's thinking is on this. It, it, it's open. I think Tennessee's um, PCA is pretty. Clear that any person within the state of Tennessee who's a resident can come and look at the records during our normal business hours, and we will honor that. We do have a custodian that they have to go through with the form. And something I wanted to ask, and I don't know if now's time, but go ahead. we get a lot of uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, right? Which is different than the Tennessee Open Records. You're talking about under for federal freedom, right? Well, well, a lot of Individuals or companies think, okay, well, I'm doing an FI, FI a FOIA request, request yes. to give me the information. Yes, because that's what it's known at the federal level. Yes. Then we refer them back to Tennessee's 
Public Records Act. And most of the time, they're not within the state. And it's then you don't respond. Right? Do you respond, Mr. Our, in the state of our law department, and the law department sends them this beautiful letter that says we don't have to because you're not. Right. I have a quick question. I just wonder, we, we mentioned the trolls, and we often have people like companies that will find a local person that sends their ID in. Yes. And we only send the records to that ethnicity address if, if we know that somebody's trolling. Or you can tell them to come pick it up. Yeah, they don't do that. So I just wondered if anybody else had had that experience that you'll get a record request from out of state, but we don't turn around and send them out of state. We send them to the address on the license. And get a request from somebody in Florida. Yeah. We can ID them. Yeah. The next thing you know, I have a forward email from somebody who actually lives in Nashville. Yeah. And if you look at the string, and it's the same. Do you ask for the driver's license at that point? And they come up with a driver's license that shows that they're a. Most of the time, they do. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. they do have a driver's license, then acknowledge that. For that address. And you would not, you don't make them, you copy it for them, and do you make them prepay to do that if it's significant? We have a software just the way that the records can study and manage that aspect of it. You can just get a record request, and you can, a lot of times they don't know to go to her first, so they come to us. Right. And we forward them over to her. But if we know that it's somebody that's out of state, then she sends them a letter and says, we won't give you these. But if you know that they're going to somebody else and somebody's just traveling, then she doesn't send them. But I just didn't know from the ethics side of things. You're very nice, honestly. I would tell them to come pick it up if I thought they were uh, 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 just trolls. Um, and Mark, if I can interject, yeah, please. This is probably an appropriate time to say. I didn't say it when I first spoke, but another issue at hand, another thing that uh, some folks are, are shooting for is to do away with the whole requirement of Tennessee citizenship. Uh, and that is Boo, yeah. an, open record, an, open record, an open record is an open record. Yeah. So to the extent that you care about that, that's another action item that you should be reaching out to your legislators to talk about. That's really that's important. That's probably the most. Yeah. That's that's and I, I should have mentioned that, but that's a that's a very significant thing because Tennessee taxpayers funded the creation of the records, and they should be open to Tennessee taxpayers for that reason. But you know, beyond that, that's a little generous. I did. I hope you will reach out. If, um, and do you know? Do you know if these is there legislation being drafted by the? the uh, it, that's not necessarily yet. Uh -huh. But I think we're gonna wait and see. Uh, just get through the election. It'll probably gel a little bit after that. Mm -hmm. Well, I I'm sure we can communicate through your through Terry and through Karen what legislation because I. Totally agree with Jason. I hope you will reach out to your senators and representatives. I'm sure there will be things, particularly the citizenship requirement. I mean, that just it's using Tennessee resources for for not a purpose that you know it just seems to me to be not 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 very wise. And I really like what you said. I think you're right. I mean, in terms of it's a service. If someone is trying to get started in business, you can learn a ton from looking at bids. I think that. Um, in many cases, that makes a lot of sense. And and but listening to you all around the room, it sounds like you have much different levels. I mean, I'm impressed that you have software that deals with it. I'm amazed. Is it all digital and just can pull it up and send it? How, what does it do? Is it just you have all your records online and then? Oh no, we have to tag. We work on passenger pigeons, but we scan it in. But you email it to them as a scan version, and you don't charge anything to do that. No, no. Um, sometimes they will, she will, if they want it printed. It depends on the size of the file. Right. Um, and it depends on how much time it takes us to generate it. Um, so if it's something that it would take, where we don't recreate anything for anybody, mm -hmm. if it's something that we can scan in and email it back to the records custodian, she just emails it out. But if it's something that's cumbersome, then she will print it out if they choose to pay. It just depends on really the size of the file, and I don't know the person can see. You made a good point that we've seen at the airport quite a bit is that, and that we've responded a number of times, is they ask for all this information thinking, we don't have it in what, and the statute is very clear that you don't have to create information for folks. And so we've written several responses saying, we don't have that information to forward your question and we're not required to create that for you. And they left us alone for the most part, although you may tell me, oh yeah, actually they've been coming back, but um, that's another 
good defense in that you're not required if someone says we want bid summaries for all this and why but if you didn't create those summaries then you don't have to go and do that for, for, for them at that point in time and the statute is pretty is not pretty as clear on that um and i also should say going back to my um my hiring th uh, thing is that you can't um um the statute also says you can't use agents to get around the statute. That's why it's such a fine line, and it's using like search firms and things like that to try to keep records private. I think we have one more slide, don't we? Uh, so the one chat. Sure. You mentioned a couple of times a, a copy of the driver's license. Yes. Is it worded that way? I, I was under the impression they had to prove, and we could use the driver's license as proof of residency. Yes. So if a person says, I'm not giving you a copy of my driver's license, they don't have to actually give you a copy of the driver. That's correct. No, I think you're right. I mean, it just said uh, we've always just used that as our surrogate for proving that they're thing. I don't think we've ever anybody pushed back saying I don't have to do that. I know and that I will give you a some other method like a utility record to show that I'm a resident of Tennessee. I mean, I think I don't. Deal with that, you mentioned it a couple times. Yes. I'm head saying well, yes. I think we can require a copy of the driver's license. No, I think if they push back and said absolutely no, that I'm going to show you. Oh, so you remember what the actual is it a citizen or resident of Tennessee? I mean, if it's resident, um, as by if what I'm right, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if they can show you that, our, I just never figured out a better way to do it. I mean, I, because now the moment that you give me a copy of your driver's license, your copy of your driver's license is now part of my open records. So right. now I've now given all your information away. Right. So, we just created a new circle. Right. So well, and they, they can also, show if they're in person, if they don't want to give you a copy, they can come show it to you, and you just don't keep a copy for your record. If that's that important to them, and I've told people that, you know, that, that the thing, but I agree with you. That, but they, I do think they have some obligation to prove to you that they're a resident of the state, and they may, you know, there are people that don't drive, you're right, and they may not have, but it, I think you're right that, that other forms of ID can work, but I think. We have not gotten much pushback, at least I'm not aware of anywhere just asking for a driver's license. And have you had pushback in that? Yes, yeah. I have someone who doesn't own a driver's license and said, so how can you require me to give you a copy of my driver's license? That That's a violation. Yeah. Like, you, um, hello, can somebody help me with this problem? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was... A governmental entity may require any person making request to view or make a copy of it to present a government issued photo identification. All right, so we can require a copy of the right. Or are there other types of photo ID? Uh, there are. There are. You can get an ID. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I think the driver license is the most commonly, but I guess if they have some sort of other photo ID, it could work. Yeah, I suppose you use a handgun carry permit. Good. Thank I you mean, for voting. No, That'd be fine. Well, they do for well, voting. Well, that'd be a scary thing, wouldn't it? And passports. Yeah. Is that a yeah. yeah. like, excuse me. And if you're saying driver's license number on your good. scary person, the number's the same. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, it looks to me, if that's the case, then that would be, I mean, any photo ID, but it also does it, I take back what I said a minute ago, it looks like you can't like take your utility bill and do that, you can say that's not sufficient. One last uh, area to cover, and Jason mentioned this, is, is I spend tons of time on economic development, and we're seeing more and more communities saying to developers, show me your pro forma, show me everything because i want to see that you really need this incentive and what we're hearing from legislators and from is that this is the right thing to do is to try to dig deep and try to not use public funds unnecessarily to incentivize you know downtown redevelopment primarily is where this comes up and well but it's really hard for a developer i mean it's basically saying your salary you know what public record. I mean, and and so we have not figured a great way around this. Um, and maybe it's the right thing. I don't know. I just know that it, often the openness of our public records in our state. At the state level, the ECD has an exception essentially for proprietary information and trade secrets. Uh, really nice lady in Spring Hill that does economic development there got through some legislation working with the senator is from from the Columbia area um, to um, keep 
essentially trade secrets and pri proprietary information um, uh, private if it's for economic development projects, community development projects, as long as it's on file with the city or the county. Where that gets tricky is, like in Knoxville, KCDC, we do lots of the tax increment financing in Nashville and DHA does that. They aren't the city or the county. It's not, and so it's really weird that any of the industrial development boards that do economic development, they would not fit within this. I tried to get them added, but the bill was so far down the pike, and we were just grateful to get anything that 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 did things. But these, you know, I think this is something that if there's legislation, I hope they'll take some time to look at it because good government says we should get as much information as possible, but you shouldn't scare away good economic development prospects to go to other states where people will spend their money where they won't have all their personal finances made public. And so I think there's got to be a good balance here that can be struck without. Um, um, and, and this is actually a good balance. I just think this statute just doesn't recognize the panoply of different uh, public entities that deal with economic development. And so um, I think that could be something that that, uh, that hopefully would be revisited. Of course, they probably want to see this thing totally, uh, uh, I say they, the people, the open, rec the open government folks would like to see this whole thing repealed. Um, but it's pretty critical. If ECD could not keep the information they have private, our economic development efforts in Tennessee, we would do, you know, we yeah. just we just couldn't do it. I mean, we would lose people, prospects for that reason alone. Um, so it's 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 really important. That is my overview. There's a lot more open records is the sort of thing we could talk about for a long time. And I asked Karen if I could cover open meetings as well, and she said you're not going to have time, and she was right. And so because that is. It, particularly in hiring process, interview process, those are really, really hard things to deal with. And so um, maybe if you were nice, I get to come back next year and bring more candy and um, and um, and get a new tie yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and get to see you guys a year from now. So any questions, particularly while we have Jason here, you, uh, anybody have anything else that they would like to ask for the good of the cause? Ms. Powell? The uh, the uh, committee is going to meet again in November uh, after the election. I don't know if that date is set specifically, but uh, but it is going to meet again in November. It may meet again in December. The legislative session will begin in January. Let me say that Senator Todd Gardenhire of Hamilton County and Representative Jason Zachary of Knox County are the co-chairs of that committee. Uh, if, if, if you wanted to reach out to them, uh, if you've heard anything that we've talked about that may make you want to reach out to them, they in particular uh, would be good ones to reach out to. But it, it will continue to meet and, uh, and then things will start to happen when the legislature reconvenes in January. We'll try to get the word out to you guys when we see things, and, and, um, and as I said, so. Anything else? Thank you, guys. Always good to see you. Thanks Thank for letting you us come.